or welcome to the Writer Reads Short Stories. Uh, this is short story number three, Earth and Lunar Dreaming. The halls of the moon were bustling with people, usually, but Kiton rose to roam the ones that everyone else avoided. He liked the relative quiet and the dimmed lighting, and he knew he had nothing to fear. In human form, he was too big for most to attack, and he was yet to meet anyone who would stand and face him when he became a wolf. Of course, if he became a wolf, it was usually so he could run and hide, vanishing through a grate in the walls of Luna 1 to emerge dressed as a workman through a maintenance hatch elsewhere. He was not the only one to frequent the tunnels, or the only one to have claimed a corner in the disused warren that had once housed the refugees of Earth. That had been many moons ago, and Kitan curled his lip at the unintended pun. Many, many moons. Uh, whoops. His people had a home on one of the outer worlds now, a place with forests to roam in, one for which their claim had been honoured. But Kitan did not feel as though he belonged there. He did not feel as though he belonged anywhere, except maybe here, in the dimly lit halls of a half-forgotten legacy. It was late, and he'd come to the dome to stare out at the stars, to drink in the view of a slowly recovering world. One day, he thought, I'll go and visit. But every night he searched his view of the Earth's surface, and every night he was disappointed to see the places he most wanted to go still glowed. Tonight he looked again and saw the same, although he imagined one small corner had grown in healthy darkness, and the thought made him smile. At this rate, I'll be covered in silver before I can stand beneath those skies and look up at where I am now, he thought, and sadness rippled through him like a stream. A small sound caught his ears. If he were in wolf form, his ears would have twitched and he'd have tilted his head, all the better to catch the sound. As it was, he tilted his head and turned his face just enough that he could catch sight of her from the corner of his eye. He knew that as soon as she knew he'd seen her, she'd bolt. He also knew she was nothing to fear. The child had been stalking him for the last five days, and he had stalked her back, just enough to ensure she posed no threat to him. She probably came off one of the cargoes, Nev Shinto had said when Kitan asked. Been a few stowaways last few weeks, probably escaped from an orphanage or traders. I don't ask, and I don't tell, you know me. Don't ask, don't tell. That was the portmaster's mantra, and Kitan wasn't going to complain. He benefited from it as much as the next wall walker. He had held up a credit stick with a distinctive red and gold star on one side, and watched Nev's eyes light up. Where does she doss? he asked. Nev might believe in don't ask, don't tell, but he could still be bought. Kitan kept that in mind every time he dealt with the man. The sound came again, pulling Kitan out of the memory. This time he could not suppress the growl rumbling from his chest. It was met with a frightened squeak, followed by a hurried scuffle, but not the pittering patter of running footsteps like before. What do you want? he said, his voice projecting in a rough bark. More sounds of movement, and this time he did turn his head. The she-child had broken cover and now approached him, wary caution in every line. Her light brown hair stuck out at odd angles from her head, as though some inexpert hair had wielded clippers to save the trouble of brushing it. In the light refracted from outside the dome, Kitan could see it was touched with striations of fawn and gold. As he watched, she palmed the fringe away from her eyes and came another few steps closer. She reminded him of a kitten, one of those from a cargo ship, all fear and defiance. The sight touched the wolf inside him, and he had to resist the urge to chase. From the scent rising off her skin, she was terrified, yet she came toward him, her face stark white, and her small jaw set with determination. "'What do you want?' he repeated, trying to keep his voice gentle. She froze, poised for flight and Kitan sighed. I'm not going to eat you, you know, and he lowered himself to the ground, curling his legs beneath him, watching her watch him, keeping an eye and an ear on the far corners of the room, and making sure the planet never left his sight. To give her credit, she did not run, although she was ready to. When he was settled, he was still as tall as she was, 
but her terror had diminished to fear and she came toward him, one slow step at a time. When she paused three metres away, Kitan tucked his hands under his legs and looked at her. In the half-light of the dome, he could see she wasn't quite as human as she appeared. Her hair had small tufts of black through the tawny yellow-brown, and her eyes were a strange blend of yellow-green tinged with the lightest shade of blue. "'What are you?' he asked, and she drew herself up to her full three and a half feet of height. She reminded him so much of a cat fluffing out its fur that he had to suppress a smile, so he ducked his head to hide the curve of his lips. Her reply wiped all amusement from his mind. "'I am a little girl,' she said, and added, "'a little human girl.' He wanted to refute that claim, but thought better of it. Something in the desperate way she had said it made him see its importance to her. Thinking quickly, he changed the subject. "'And what is a little human girl doing following me around?' I want to hire you. This time, Kitan didn't bother to suppress the bark of laughter. And what makes you think you have anything I would want? He had made her angry, he could see, but she raised her chin and glared at him. Because I stole it from your lair and hid it where you will not be able to find it. That stopped his laughter in its tracks. You what? I took the notebook. And your order, Cam, she said, holding herself very still. And I hid them where you cannot fit. Now he wasn't in the mood to laugh at all. Go and get them and give them back, he said, the softness of his voice denoting anger. No, you have no idea what you are playing with. Again, that defiant tilt of the chin and this time a small smirk of satisfaction. I am being chased by a very big cat, she said, and you are a very big dog. I'm a what? Kitan was on his feet before he could remind himself to sit still, but this time the little girl stood her ground. You are a dog. I have seen you, she hesitated, looking up at him, her eyes as big as saucers. A very big dog, she added and then, as though trying to placate him, with beautiful fur. Kitan felt his cheeks grow warm and knew he was blushing. Well, I still want my stuff back, he said, his anger at being mistaken for a dog subsiding. And I want you to make the cat go away. Kitan sighed. He supposed it wouldn't hurt to humour her. He crouched down in front of her and looked into her eyes. He was very aware of earth hanging in the darkness outside the dome, of the way the dawn fringed the world in yellow light. But with an effort, he kept his eyes on her face. What does this cat look like? He looks like you. But I'm a wolf. She frowned at that. Kitan watched her process wolf and give an internal shrug. Wolf, dog, he supposed it was all the same to her he would still have to deal with the cat to get his stuff back. Well, he's a cat, but he looks like a person. Then how do you know he's a cat? That pulled her up short, and she stared at him. For a moment he thought she might tell him, but then she said, I just do, in the way of all children who don't want to explain. Her voice dared him to say otherwise. So what does he look like as a human? Well, he has scary yellow eyes that sometimes look orange and skin like mine, a black beard and reddish-brown hair.